tensions between the United States and China have been rising in recent years, but what if things spiraled out of control? The year is 2026, and tensions between the US and China have never been higher. The United States maintains a robust geopolitical presence in the Pacific and has many allies among China's neighbors, including South Korea, Japan, and the contested island of Taiwan. While the US largely considers Taiwan an independent country and has key trade with it, China considers it a rogue province to be taken back by any means necessary. But that won't be possible with Taiwan's collection of US-provided defenses, at least not without a terrible cost. And that's just the start of the troubles. China's been rapidly expanding in the South China Sea, building artificial islands that are soon transformed into military bases, taking over territorial waters of countries like Vietnam and the Philippines, and declaring international waters to be its sovereign territory. That extends to using Chinese planes to harass other countries' planes and ships, sometimes by flying within feet of them. That was a recipe for disaster, and in recent years, there's been more than one crash taking the lives of Chinese and American pilots. The United States blamed China, China blamed the US, and both rattled their sabers until the situation was diffused. But the good luck can't last forever. Relations haven't been that good for a long time, but they've deteriorated since the election of a new US president who was largely elected based on his promises for a tough line on China. The US has stepped up its presence around Japan and South Korea, ready to spring into action to defend Taiwan at a moment's notice. Meanwhile in China, Xi Jinping is holding on to power, but barely. He's had a terrible few years, dealing with a mass outbreak of COVID in China, ongoing student protests, and a struggling economy as many Western companies move away from China and toward its rivals. Many hardliners want him out, while many reform activists want him to go and take the entire Chinese Communist Party with him. It all brings to mind another leader caught between a rock and a hard place. She is determined not to wind up like Mikhail Gorbachev, the last leader of the Soviet Union who was ousted by hardliners and then replaced by the democratic forces who beat him. He also knows that the public has a short memory, and all it takes is one big victory to save a regime. China has wanted to move on Taiwan for a long time, but the US has long promised to step in to defend the island if need be, and he can't risk a humiliating military defeat like Russia saw in Ukraine when the Russian military was caught flat-footed by the advanced weapons provided by NATO. If China wants to take Taiwan, they'll have to catch the US off balance and make sure there is no going back. Xi Jinping is going to take the biggest risk in modern military history, and it all hinges on China's secret weapon. If the US sees a Chinese attack on Taiwan coming, they'll likely marshal their forces around the island to defend it. That would mean that a Chinese attack would have to go through US troops, likely starting World War III. China has no hunger for that if they can avoid it, and they'd rather take over Taiwan without having to deal with the US. To do that, it'll have to catch the US unaware, which is near impossible given today's top secret surveillance. That's where China's cyber core comes in. Infamous for hacking attacks on both government organizations and private companies, they've caused a lot of problems and gotten their hands on a lot of classified information. But they've never done anything like this. It's the morning of March 27th when the residents of the United States wake up and immediately start cursing at their internet provider. Just about everyone seems to be experiencing communication difficulties, and no one knows exactly what's going on. But this is much worse than a standard service outage. Much of the US digital infrastructure has been hit with a massive denial of service attack, shutting down communications at the highest level. US cyber experts work quickly and get things up and running, and they quickly find evidence of Chinese hacking efforts. And as the news sites come back up, Americans everywhere see images of Chinese warships streaming toward Taiwan. The president was informed of this earlier, but with much of the US military infrastructure temporarily out of commission, any response was delayed. It's clear the cyber attack was a deliberate attempt to sabotage a US response to the invasion, and the president is not happy. He tries to contact Xi Jinping, but the Chinese leader is not responding. The president immediately orders US ships in the area to head for Taiwan, which is already being shelled by Chinese ships, as China demands the island's surrender. A tense situation is about to get much worse. It's not long before Xi Jinping makes a public appearance giving a speech that sets the stakes of the conflict. He announces that China is in the process of pacifying a rogue territory with military force, and that just like Hong Kong, this is an internal Chinese matter. Now that the war has already begun, Xi warns that any intervention by outside forces will be considered an attack on China, and threatens dire consequences for any country that interferes. It's clear that the gambit by Xi was to delay an American response until the attack was underway, and now the president must choose whether to directly engage with the Chinese ships. 
It's not much of a question for this president. After a heated debate with the Joint Chiefs and his diplomatic and military teams, and several attempts to contact Xi and warn him off his course, the president decides to order the U.S. ships in the region to continue to Taiwan, no matter who they have to go through. China has quickly marshaled its forces for a military blockade of Taiwan, surrounding the island nation with ships and submarines. As some of them blast Taiwan's ports and target key locations in Taipei, others watch the seas for potential intervention. And as soon as the U.S. ships enter the waters, both sides spring into action. The Chinese forces inform the Americans that they're entering Chinese waters and must turn back. The U.S. ships radio back that they are delivering supplies to an ally and are in international waters. After several rounds of threats, the U.S. ships continue to plow forward, and the Chinese commanders give the order. Chinese ships and planes fire on the ships, causing serious damage, but the Americans fire back. While several U.S. ships are sunk, the larger ones manage to break the blockade and shoot countless Chinese planes out of the sky. However, just getting to Taiwan does not end the conflict. The port is being heavily targeted by Chinese fire, and the conflict is ongoing. By the end of the initial round of shooting, hundreds are dead on both sides. And one question is on everyone's mind. That night, the rhetoric is strong, coming from both sides. China accuses the U.S. of invading its territory and threatens the U.S. mainland with retaliation. The president refers to the attack on U.S. ships as a new Pearl Harbor and vows that, just like Ukraine, the U.S. will supply Taiwan with anything it needs to fight back against the invaders. But right now, both parties are still treating this largely as a regional conflict, and both the president and Xi Jinping have kept their fingers off the nuclear trigger. After all, that would blow things up into an existential threat to Earth. For now. As the events proceed, it's clear preventing escalation is going to be very hard. The U.S. Congress quickly approves a robust aid package, including state-of-the-art weapons, to Taiwan, partially in the name of the U.S. soldiers who fell in the initial Battle of Taiwan. Xi Jinping marshals the troops. The hardliners in the CCP start issuing dire warnings that the U.S. is coming for Hong Kong and even the mainland next. The shelling of Taiwan continues, and the naval blockade makes it much harder to get supplies through. While the United States continues to challenge the blockade at a great personal cost, many of their usual stalwart allies in the region like Japan and South Korea are hesitant to get involved. After all, they're in prime range for Chinese retaliation. The casualties are piling up, and it's a question of who will escalate first. The largest problem for the United States is that China has the advantage in the region due to the ease of supplying military hardware from its military bases. While the U.S. has many bases in the region, they're in foreign countries who are hesitant to help. China, meanwhile, has spent years militarizing the region, not just establishing bases on the mainland and in territories like Hong Kong, but creating artificial islands in the South China Sea that they turn into standalone bases. That makes it easy for them to keep the blockade intact, even as U.S. ships challenge it. So to give the U.S. a fighting chance, those bases will have to go. After a final attempt to warn Xi Jinping off the conflict and warn that the cyber attack that kicked off the conflict was an act of war, the president authorizes military strikes against several PRC military bases in the South China Sea, as well as against the major Yulin and Zhangguo Hong naval bases along China's coast. These attacks, using conventional bombs and targeted ordnance, successfully devastate much of China's arsenal in the bases, while not targeting any major cities and keeping casualties relatively low. In the aftermath of the attack, the president once again warns China to withdraw its attack on Taiwan, or the U.S. will hit more of its bases, and everyone in Washington nervously waits for a response. In the halls of the Chinese Communist Party, a civil war is quickly ramping up. Hardliners in the military view the attacks on the bases as a full declaration of war and want China to unleash its nuclear forces on the United States. Others worry that this will be a losing prospect for China. While China has one of the world's best and most advanced nuclear programs, it barely has 10% of the nuclear weapons the U.S. has. They're calling for a proportionate response, one that hits the U.S. hard and scares them off, without being a point that the U.S. can't come back from, like a hit on a major mainland city. After looking at his option, Xi Jinping picks his target. The island territory of Guam is located in the Pacific Ocean, part of a huge area filled with islands and relatively close to Japan, the Philippines, and New Zealand. It's also a U.S. holding and is home to 168,000 people, as well as Naval Base Guam, one of the United States' most critical military bases. From deep in the heartland of China, three ballistic missiles of the People's Liberation Army Rocket Force lift up out of silos and into the sky. Approximately 20 minutes later, Guam's Patriot Air Defense batteries fill the sky with interceptors, but they can't stop all the multiple independently targeting warheads. 
Mushroom clouds rise over the island territory. Tens of thousands die. Nuclear war has officially begun. Xi Jinping quickly issues a statement that the war was begun by the US and that Guam was a legitimate military target, and warns that any retaliation will lead to strikes against the US proper. But no one expects the US to back down, not with so many US citizens dead. The president and his team meet in a secure location, as now everyone's worried about Chinese missiles hitting the mainland, and many officials believe it's time for all-out war. Hitting Beijing and Shanghai is discussed in an attempt to break China's spirit and force them to surrender, the same way that many believe the first bombs caused Japan to surrender. But there's a good chance no one is the winner in this scenario. But a nuclear attack demands a nuclear response. The president authorizes tactical nuclear attacks on major Chinese military bases around Asia, including the massive Zhuri training base in Inner Mongolia. This is the first strike deep within China, and it shows that the United States is ready to hit the mainland, while minimizing damage to large cities. The US also authorizes conventional weapon attacks against China's military base in Djibouti and against the Hong Kong military bases, while also expressing their support for Hong Kong independence and beginning a propaganda campaign to undermine Chinese rule in the province. But at this point, everyone is on high alert. As the US weapons fly, so do Chinese weapons, targeting US military bases in Japan and South Korea, and essentially drawing these countries into the war. While China uses low-yield weapons to minimize non-US casualties, they still cause major casualties in both the US-aligned countries. However, both countries are largely keeping their strategic nuclear weapons in the barrel, the kind used to obliterate major cities. It seems to be the last taboo in the war, as casualties creep up toward the millions. It's an unsustainable status quo and it's about to cross a line. A tactical nuclear war isn't all that different from a conventional war, with the added terror of long-term radiation contamination. And in a conventional war, someone's going to win and someone's going to lose. The US is aiming to bludgeon China into submission and hope that its saner figures win out, and they're specifically targeting China's nuclear submarines. After all, China's believed to have only around 350 nuclear weapons, and while it's impossible to know where they are, the US believes it sent many of them loaded on its boomer subs to the bottom of the ocean. Soon the effects of the US assault are clear. China's having a harder time fending off US ships at the blockade, and aid is getting to Taiwan. While China occupies Taiwan currently, the Taiwanese resistance is gaining strength. It's do or die time for China. Over the objections of the cooler heads in the Chinese government, Xi Jinping authorizes strikes on US military bases in the states, including a massive strike on the island state of Hawaii and an east coast attack targeting the largest US naval bases in Norfolk, Virginia, too close for comfort to Washington, DC. As the long-range missiles are fired, US interceptors spring into action. The defenses around Norfolk are surprisingly robust and manage to intercept the missiles. Hawaii isn't so lucky as a large number of missiles from the Pacific Theater target the nation and target naval station Pearl Harbor, with far more devastating weapons than hit them in 1941. Pearl Harbor sustains a direct hit, and the powerful weapons destroy much of Hawaii, including Honolulu, claiming over a million lives. The US and China are now engaged in a full-fledged nuclear war, with casualties ranging in the millions and the Washington DC area directly threatened for the first time, the public is firmly behind the war and most people support direct nuclear retaliation against China, no matter the cost. All major DC officials are moved to safe locations and the president is moved to a mobile command center far away from anywhere China could target to decide his next move. Everyone knows that a direct assault on China would likely result in an equivalent assault on the US mainland. And while the US lucked out with intercepting the Norfolk attack, it's not likely to repeat itself. While the US can likely outlast China in a nuclear war, a full assault of both countries' weapons would likely render much of both countries uninhabitable for decades, especially with so much of the US population clustered on the coasts. This is the conversation that might determine the fate of the world. The president authorizes his plan of action, and US submarines stream toward the coastal city of Shanghai, the third largest city in the world with over 25 million residents and the home of some of China's largest naval bases. Is the US about to commit the largest act of nuclear war in the history of humanity? And what will it trigger? Chinese forces are put on high alert, and the nuclear forces are ready to launch against major US targets including California, Texas, and New York. Everyone braces for a strategic nuclear strike against Shanghai. And then, it doesn't come. Taking a page from Ukraine's high-stakes gambit that led to the liberation of Kherson, the US lulled China into assuming a specific attack was coming, and then used the opportunity to launch a sneak attack against other military bases and Chinese ships in the South China Sea. 
and the Taiwan Strait. Dozens of Chinese ships are sunk, taking many of their nuclear weapons armed to fire at the U.S. with them. From there, the U.S. launches attacks on several coastal Chinese military bases using low-yield tactical nuclear weapons but sparing most of the city. China ends the day on the defensive in Taiwan, with much of its nuclear arsenal scuttled. And the question is, can they retaliate? Because even when you can't win a nuclear war, you can make sure no one else can either. Both countries' nuclear forces remain on high alert as everyone waits to see China's next move. While their capabilities are much reduced, China still has a number of mobile nuclear launchers. Unlike missiles in silos, these are much harder to target and destroy. That means the country could still unleash a suicide volley to close out a war that's likely impossible to win, at which point the United States would likely destroy Shanghai and Beijing and bring both countries closer to complete ruin. But as people wait in both countries, that's not what happens. Without a word of surrender, Chinese forces pull back from Taiwan to regroup, refocus around Hong Kong and the mainland, and go silent. Eventually, a Chinese Communist Party functionary who is distinctly not Xi Jinping makes a statement that the country concedes nothing and is withdrawing temporarily to rebuild its forces and will respond to the U.S. assault at a later date. A clear attempt to save face, but one that both parties are willing to take. The United States pulls back from its direct confrontation with the Chinese mainland and marshals its forces around Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan, helping to rebuild the damaged areas and restoring its own military bases. But the toll of even this limited nuclear exchange is near incalculable. It's likely that both countries have suffered losses in the millions, with many of their military bases destroyed and island outposts suffering devastating damage. China suffered more damage on its mainland from tactical nuclear weapons, but mostly in military locations away from major population centers. The United States was able to prevent a major strike on its eastern seaboard, but it lost the island of Guam and the state of Hawaii suffered major damage. Anywhere that tactical nuclear weapons were used likely has serious radiation contamination, and in some cases it'll be years or more before the areas can be restored and inhabitable again. And this is the best case scenario. Why did this nuclear exchange not descend into total nuclear war? It's partially due to cooler heads prevailing, but it's also due to the overall imbalance between the two countries' nuclear arsenals. The US has built a nuclear arsenal designed to combat Russia's in a scenario of mutually assured destruction. China's much smaller nuclear arsenal is designed for tactical war rather than total war, and both sides knew this. China knew after the early stages of the war that it was unlikely to win a global thermonuclear war, while the US knew they had a good chance of winning if they kept the war more restrained. But this relied on a lot of luck. Both countries had moments where they pulled the trigger on nuclear attacks and one thing could go wrong and easily triggered a full-on nuclear exchange. If the missiles make it through the U.S. defenses and hit Norfolk, the odds are Washington will feel they have no choice but unleash missiles on Shanghai. Likewise, if a jittery captain in a Shanghai standoff fires, the war might reach the point of no return. This was likely the best-case scenario for a nuclear war, a limited exchange that leaves millions dead, two militaries largely in ruins, and both countries in an indefinite standoff. And both know that a resumption of hostilities could be the last war for everyone. And all it took was everyone staying cool-headed. Should be no problem for politicians. For how the US would fare against another enemy, check out What If There Was A Nuclear War Between The US And Russia? Or watch I Survived 100 Days Of Nuclear War, Not Minecraft, for a more personal look at the cataclysm.